you know, it's funny. I've been talking to some of you today, and I've learned that I was doing this before a lot of you were even born. Who in this room, who was born after 1985? Raise of hands. Look at you. OK, so who was born, sorry to ask, after 1989? Ah, man, I, I love it. It's so great. So the first thing I want to do is say a big thank you to all of you for staying through the end. A thank you for da to David for putting this together. For Thomas Knoll, where are you, Thomas? I don't see you. Hi, Thomas. I, I can't see, so I know you're out there somewhere. Thomas, for introducing me to David. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to the sponsors who made this possible. Uh, live stream people out there, it's great to have you here, and to all of you for being part of this community. So I have three personal things I want to share before I get started. One of them is my name on Twitter is Cheptoom. And it was given to me by people that I don't even know while I was traveling. Chep means woman in a language of the Great Rift Valley, Nandi Kalenjin. Toom means to bring together or to gather. So my name given to me by people who I did not know means the woman who brings people together, community, or as I like to say, party girl. <laughs> the second thing that I want to say is, um, I'm going to be using, actually this will make it four things. The second thing I want to say is that I'm going to be using notes, and I've juggled back and forth a little bit to get them right, so please bear with me if for any reason I'm not right on the money. You'll help me get it right. The third thing I want to say is something really awesome um, happened this morning. It's very meaningful to me, actually. This is a mug for the Apple User Group Connection. And I bought it on eBay. I won it this morning for $9.99. I haven't seen this mug since 1987. Not this very one, but one like it. This was made at Apple during the time I was running the communities and user groups. And it just happened, I was looking for photos, and it just happened to pop up last night. I won it, and I have it now in my world to remember all of you and this day, because this is the fourth thing. This has been an amazing day for me. You know, as you'll hear in my talk, I was Apple's nerd queen. I was the person that was a little bit of that untouched one that no one wanted to talk about. And as I said to John Scully, who was such a champion, John, do you remember that day that I came into your office crying? He said to me, which time? <laughs> Ellen, you came into my office crying all the time. And it was like that. It was a fight. And I know from talking to so many of you today, you're out there fighting and championing too, trying to get people to catch up with this vision that you know is real. But I've heard from the speakers today and from other people that I've spoken to, you have already made this real. The progress that's been created by the people in this room and the fact that this room has even gathered together is a tipping point. The evidence is in. When I look at the level of value and insight that every speaker has brought to this conversation, and when I hear from you the things that you figured out how to fix and that you're actually doing to change the relationship between companies and the people they depend on for survival, for growth, you've made it real. And with that, I want to say a big thank you. You're blowing me away. And the theme we have today is live long and prosper. Now, if you'll bear with me, because I'm probably going to mess up my slides a little bit, let's see if we can pull it off. So you're blowing me away, absolutely blowing me away. And in the next 40 minutes, I hope to share some things that inspire you too. We're going to talk about Apple, but we're also going to talk about spiral nebula and African villages, botanic symbiosis, Facebook evolution, the Tokyo subway system, slime mold, dot matrix printers, and the Mars rover, and a few other things. But if you're like me, and if you're in this room, you are a little bit, we're all a little bit alike, aren't we? In the end, it's all going to fit together, because we know that any community brings diverse and sometimes unconventional elements together, creating a whole that is bigger than the sum of the parts. But first, I want to say one more time, it is awesome to be here with you and to feel the brilliance and the intelligence that you're bringing to the world of changing how companies work through the power of community. It does feel like a tipping point to me and a huge change and payoff from what it felt like in 1985. So my message to you again is thank you. And let's boldly go where no community conference talk has ever gone before. I think we'll have some fun. Oops. This is where I have to get used to my, OK, I think I've debugged. Let's boldly go where no community conference talk has gone before. And most of all, let's have some fun. Let's begin with a trip back in time. 
back to when we humans started to branch off from our family tree and take on some new skills. Opposing our thumbs was one of those skills, and soon making tools, taming fire, creating social order, way back to that time. Community was how we survived. We worked together, played together, built things together, gathered for rituals, and cared collectively for elders and young. It wasn't a choice. Bringing down a mastodon, gathering food, remembering nomadic paths, and making sense out of the universe. All of this was the work of communities and the technologies we developed, be they smoke signals or bear traps, cave paintings, or keys to understanding how the seasons worked. They served to strengthen our clans and increase our collective odds of survival. Sustaining life was the purpose of community, and sharing was the way we conserved our resources and learned from one another. Speaking of community, I, someone out there is cheering me on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We were tinkerers. We were makers. And because we lived in community, this was a collaborative and inherently social process. A bright thinker might have chiseled out an MVP, a new type of spearhead or a stone that rolled, and the community would get to work in improving it. Oh, sorry. Back. Iteration might not have been as rapid as in the digital world, but no doubt about it. Early communities co-created. They took prototypes. They tested in the field. They added new levels of value, and they refined innovations together. This is how we advanced, powered by levers and wheels and arrowheads and growing tribal knowledge crowdsourced in our communities. Then something changed. Some say it was agriculture, us learning to cultivate crops and thus wanting to own the property we worked to farm on. Some say it was the rise of alphabets, allowing us to move from the spoken word, peer to peer, to the written word, which enabled one to many. With these changes, we humans started to think different. We started to own things. If you'd worked all year to tend a crop and care for your land, you probably saw its harvest as yours, not everybody's. And if you learned from or were ruled by a reader who broadcast their thinking to you and to those around you, you probably saw them as a higher up, not an equal in your community, which meant that many of us took a step down. Oh, do you know what? I have the wrong slides here. Thanks for bearing with me, alphabet. Which meant that many of us took a step down. Things, things such as stone tablets or plots of lands began to stratify society, not the character, wisdom, or special talent that might have marked leaders in early communities. When we humans learned to farm and learned to write and to broadcast, our social order became hierarchical. We traded community for command and control. Now, recent research shows that DNA may actually be able to hold and preserve and thus transmit certain types of knowledge, specifically memories. The research is from Emory University, and it's fascinating. If that's so, is it possible that some distant memory of our community roots is still etched on our DNA. Yes, community favored us for survival, but perhaps there's a coefficient here. Perhaps our DNA remembers a truth from our most ancient times. Because community, as we see here today, is unstoppable. It's what we do. It's maybe even what we are. Like a superorganism, which is one of those biological colonies of like individuals within a species that works together on a collective and often multi-generational goal, we evolve together, sharing memes and co-creating movements and even in participating in what Carl Jung labeled the collective consciousness. How much of this is nature and how much nurture? I can't say. But I find it interesting that at this time, when technology connects us better than ever, the changes we embrace most elevate things like peer-to-peer -peer communication, co-creation, collaborative economies and technologies, sharing models, and tools for the disintermediation or disruption of legacy hierarchies. Some of our most fascinating and globally relevant technologies may hark back to our community roots. 
It's as if we're working together as a superorganism to reclaim the wisdom of an ancient heritage. So why is creating, supporting, and benefiting from community still a struggle for so many? Why do we see community members as outsiders, nerds, geeks, outliers, antagonists, rather than holders of our timeless wisdom? Why do we pride ourselves on technology that inspires us, thinking it's something new, something that we've created for the first time? Oh, I have to get this slide thing down. Leah had very nicely asked to help me with it, and I think next time I'll listen to you, Leah. OK, this is the one, the holder of ancient wisdom. This is us going, oh, wow, new technology. But let's remember. Let's remember how it's how we began. Sharing technology, learning from each other, and working as a community to make things better is an essential part of both our nature and our nurture. What do we do? It's a problem. What's the solution? Let's explore some answers, opening with a story from Apple. We all know the basic theme. Within a year of the dazzling Macintosh launch, Apple faced an unprecedented low. A venerated but volatile CIO, CEO had been ousted under tense conditions. Sales slumped, development traveled an uncertain path, and hundreds of thousands of once devoted users made their frustration, even their anguish, known. The community was rising. They knew we could do better, and they demanded change. As Dave said a few moments ago, hate might be the signal that you're at the point of something very good. A community will hold you accountable to be the best that you can be, and that's what our, com our users did to us, our, our community did to us in 1985. But remember, this was 1985. And although Apple looked like this on the outside, remember, this was before email. This was before online connectivity, certainly before mobile phones. So although we looked like this fresh young company, like any other company in the valley, we had a very different face inside. We relied on archaic systems, legacy systems, hierarchical systems, and the processes they mandated. As a matter of fact, this is a form that a user would have to fill out in order to register a product they buy with Apple. They had to write on this form, fill in the numbers that they, they read on a little embossed foil uh, label at the bottom of the box. Then they would mail it into Apple, where it would arrive at the desk of someone sitting by a keyboard with a big database. They would type it in, hoping they got everything accurate. And then you would be a registered Apple user. Imagine the complexity of interacting with users at a time like this. Mail, teletypes, fax machines, clunky landlines. I won't say Morse code, but I'm telling you, it wasn't much better. Communication technology was primitive, at least compared to today. Take a look at the dot matrix printer up there. That's what passed for high resolution printing uh, back at that time. These were different times. Communication was harder. But that didn't stop people from communicating, especially not community members. Here's what greeted me when I walked into my cubicle on Banley Drive on a September day in 1985 when I began as Apple's first user evangelist. It actually looked a lot more like this, covering my desk, stacks of paper everywhere, typed, printed, handwritten letters. They came from teachers and scientists, from hardworking parents and, and people revolutionizing business with the power of our technology, from Marin, Madrid, Madagascar, and all of them were angry. They felt disillusioned, betrayed. They'd taken out their wallets and opened up their hearts to believe in a dream that Apple was selling, to change the world through the power of personal computing, and they felt we'd abandoned them. The words and letters on the letters were discouragingly consistent. I saved for two years to buy an Apple II, believing it would change my future, my job, my workplace, my classroom, my child's opportunities, my dreams. Now you've frozen that computer in time, Apple. It's become obsolete, eclipsed by a computer I can't afford. Or even from Mac users, 
Apple, you've given me this breakthrough new technology, but you leave me alone with it, with no easy way to stay apprised of or take advantage of your ongoing cha changes. It was a tough first day with many more to follow. But what I did is what any of us in this room would have done. I picked up the phone, and I started calling the people who'd written those letters. They told me what they wanted. They wanted outreach. They wanted honesty. They wanted rapport. Nothing about that was unreasonable. But remember, it was all difficult, slow moving, and expensive, because computer was archaic back, con communication was archaic back then. It was physical. It was moving atoms through space, which meant printing, mailing, collating, and even getting those addresses from archaic databases like the ones people had typed into. It meant all of that complexity. I was scared. I wasn't sure it could be done. This is me, by the way, and it's a, oh, that's not me. <laughs> what happened? Now that, this is me, but, okay. That's great. Thank you. I wish I were Andy Hertzfeld, I'd be a whole lot smarter. This is me, and it's a good thing more than my hair has changed. Because as I went through these stacks of letters, I noticed something unusual about some of them. There are these code-like numbers printed in that dot matrix font, you know the little dots we used to see? And when I called one of the people whose letter had that number on it, I asked him what those numbers meant, and he told me. I like to remember that that call was to NASA and that I spoke with Dave Lavery. And by the way, if anyone wants to tweet it, say a hello to Dave Lavery and tell him I'm talking about him. It's Dave Lavery, nothing that, L-A-V-E-R-Y. He was at NASA, and I don't know if I really talked to him, but that's the way I like to remember him, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you a picture of him shortly. But what he told me is that those odd numbers were identifiers for BBS systems, an address essentially for a node in a global bulletin board system network, and that Apple users everywhere were tying in, tapping in, to that global network to share information and support with each other, essentially to become an edge, a front line for our product. And we were doing nothing to support them. These Apple loyal loyalists were connecting to share tips, to fix bugs, to offer best practices, brags, rants, even the latest rumor, computer to computer across offices, universities, and ad hoc people in towns around the world, they had created a community, and we weren't in it. Okay, now we're tracking. This is great. You see, Apple's most passionate users thought different with more than our technology. Innovation mattered to their work. They depended on it, whether they were researching, teaching, running businesses, or being parents, being families. Because they needed our innovation to survive, at least in their work, they turned to each other as a community. They crowdsourced, they shared, they co-created, they collaborated, they socialized and they iterated. They were making our products better without our help. Now back then, they were connecting through, mo wait. I'm gonna do this better next time. Thank you, I'm sorry for the back and forth. Through the power of modems, they were connecting, sharing information with each other. And they were sustaining an Apple drumbeat, even as the one from Cupertino waned. And they created a measurable value on our behalf. What could we do to help them? Now, many people would think this was the front line of Apple at this time. You see here in this picture, these incredible creators that were keeping Apple alive. That's Waz, Andy Hertzfeld, and I'm pretty sure this guy's Bill Atkinson, who wrote Mac Paint. But there were other people helping us too, and they were in user groups across the country and around the world, gathering together to offer support and to support each other with the power of our products. Here's an example of the work that they did. This is from the Stanford Macintosh user group circa, I believe, 1987. People would publish newsletters like this. You see this is actually taken from print. And they would share it with each other. Imagine without an internet. Imagine having to physically print these, draw people together. They were finding and sharing this information with each other and making it available to their members on our behalf. The wealth of user-generated, crowdsourced intelligence rivaled, or maybe even was more than, anything that could have originated in Cupertino. Fortunately, some people had the vision at Apple to reach out and forge a connection. 
The rest, as they say, is history. First, talking, starting to share information with that BBNS network and telling our users more than we'd ever told them before. So some, we would send people to user group meetings and community meetings and then trying things like having John Scully, and this was in 1985, and John was a champion of our early community movement, host CEO chats with our communities from his home on Sunday nights. A shout out to Joe Hutzko, Joe Hutzko on Twitter, at Joe Hutzko, for helping make these happen. We called them, when I look back, we say they were like proto hangouts before anybody was gathering to have that kind of talk. I should be very careful there, that's not accurate. Not before anyone was gathering, but before companies thought it was okay to make themselves open to communities and to increase the permeability. The communities were doing it anyway. The difference with Apple was the company showed up to be part of that talk. The next step moved beyond talking and it moved to listening. And I have to shout out Guy Kawasaki for helping to make that happen. While other people resisted the opportunity to talk with our users, to ask them what they wanted from our products, Guy demanded it. He showed up in those user meetings and wanted to learn, and he drove product and strategy decisions based on what our users said they wanted most. We started getting good at working with these people. We started understanding their needs and listening to them and understanding how helping them ultimately helped us. It wasn't easy. It was unrelenting, underappreciated. It was resisted internally. It was underfunded. And no matter what we did, it was never enough. There was always more to be done. And as you know, communities aren't shy about telling you so. But it was so much fun. We saw our work make a difference. We felt it start to humanize a company at a time when technology was only about the machine. Sometimes that's still true, but we were able to gather in a circle, sit in that circle, and have our community tell us how to make our products and even our company better. That helped set a course for us, and maybe for some other companies, to see the advantages of being more permeable, more available, more interactive with our users. I wish I could name all of the amazing people who helped Apple open itself up, but if I tried or if I started, I wouldn't know where to stop. But these people absolutely shaped our future as a company. They helped turn Apple into the company they believed we could become, person by person, holding us accountable, gaining momentum as they and we grew. Here are a few of us at a user group advisory council meeting in 1987. And now a question. With all that we learned and all that you already know in this room, why are so many companies still resisting community when the only reason community exists is to help us get better? I'm still thinking about that one, and I wonder, what do we do about it? Let's go back to the alphabet. It's a theory I have, and it's very lightweight, and I don't know if there's any scientific backing for it. But exploring it, thinking about it, might help us seek a solution. You see, not too long after agriculture and alphabets pivoted early human behavior, we started thinking differently about innovation. A lot of what we created began to be about one to many rather than the good of the community. It's a big simplification, but much of our innovation, as the chart shows, was geared toward enhancing the power and the reach of the few to increase their authority over the many. As hunter-gatherers, we had to share, but as property owners and message amplifiers, we began to separate ourselves and stratify our societies. Advances in communication, navigation, warfare, learning, food production, medicine, gave us many advantages, but the price we paid was to move from our communities, creating new types of haves and new types of have-nots, diluting the importance of the sharing that had sustained our earlier survival. In essence, innovation and the things that motivated innovation tended to separate us rather than bring us together. With time, this divide accelerated. The Industrial Revolution and the antecedents to our current communication, transportation, and manufacturing industries further fueled this separation. Companies made things that people bought, producers and consumers. Once the transaction was complete, the realities of production-based businesses generally pointed these companies to building and selling the next thing, rather than the burden of maintaining, supporting, interacting with the thing they'd already sold. 
Culturally, community lost its voice when it came to guiding the creation and the relationship with the products that we chose. As companies began to see themselves as the creators of the products, even of the demand for them, they separated themselves from the user's relationship with them. When we look at that as part of a long-term continuum, maybe we can understand why so many companies don't value their communities. Over thousands of years, we've lost the knowledge that our users are inextricably linked to our ongoing evolution and success. But things may be changing. So many of the products emerging today are linked by design to a relationship with its users. And new co-creative, personalized, and crowd-supported models are built with community at the very core part of the foundation. And along with that foundation, new abilities to track and analyze data, both online and offline, show us what we community people have known all along, that patterns of community are part of something greater, something irrepressible. Patterns of community echo other patterns across science. Look at a social graph. The data it reveals will help us understand and improve, oops, excuse me, help us understand and improve the way we live in suburbia. Maybe the way we learn from rural networks, huts, and the roads that connect them. The way we map our career choice. The way we watch the routes shared of shared car, shares driving system. This is actually a data visualization showing efficiencies created by car sharing. We'll remember that this is part of nature because this actually is a map from a botanic, a symbiotic um, system in botany between fungal threads connecting different species of uh, trees together, sharing nutrients back and forth to keep the entire ecosystem healthy. That's a community. One of my favorite examples is here. The Tokyo subway system, oops, so this isn't just me. The button is a little bit off here. The Tokyo subway system, engineers worked for decades to optimize this, to figure out the most efficient load balancing and flows between different subway stops. It took decades and it was iterated again and again, countless engineering hours. Here's what a community of slime mold did with the map of the, so the Tokyo subway system in 26 hours. They completely rebuilt that system, optimizing it for load balancing and load flow by the intelligence, the collective intelligence of community. So I wonder, if we see how these relationships work in the real world, why do we minimize their potential in the world of business? And what can we learn from science, as well as history, to change that? Why do we see our customers like this, and not this? <laughs> think, why do we think our technologies empower this, Good. and not this? And what do we do about it? What's up? Oh, you guys, you're being so, I want to tell you. Sorry. It's between toggling these buttons and so forth, I'm going to find a better way for next time. But thanks for being with me through it. <laughs> oh, you're so nice. And we're not done yet. OK, here we are. This is what you asked. I asked, the, I asked questions. What do you guys want to talk about? I loved your questions, but I also kind of hated them, because <laughs> they showed that some of the most basic things that we all should have figured out by now we're still waiting to change. Now, things I've heard in this room today, it really tells me we're accelerating. We are reaching a tipping point. But it's hard for me to think that after all of these years, companies are still asking questions like, what's the ROI of this? I loved it when someone said it should be one of the first five jobs founded in a company. Absolutely, it should. You should build from the foundation of community as a fuel cell of what it takes for your companies to reach their goals, rather than going back and saying, well, how are they going to make us more money in the future? How do we shift that? I do have a few answers, because I tried to answer these questions. But I'm sorry that we're still dealing with questions like that. We should have moved further. So I know that this is a struggle sometime. And now I'm going to do something with my computer that should make everything a little bit easier going forward. I'm going to escape out of this view, if it'll let me. Oh, this is ridiculous. OK, I'm going to just I'm going to power through here. The first thing I want to say is, you know, how do you get this job done? 
How do you do it without reaching that point of frustration where you feel you can't go on anymore and you want to believe that it's all going to work out in the end? I want to say first, think of the long game, the really long game. I do believe we're at a tipping point, and I think it's fueled by a return to a more sustainable way of thinking about business and the disintermediation of the hierarchies that have held us back. They've invalidated the importance of communities in product and business relationships, and I think that you are absolutely at the point of breaking through that. I also want to say choose your science. You know, we heard a lot of things today about ways people were thinking about this. We heard about data and the way that data helps us understand communities. We went as far as talking about shamanism and the way that that helps us understand communities. The lens I choose is anthropology, human history. But there are so many other lenses that you can choose. You can look at cognitive science. You can look at physics, uh, social science, systems theory, even neuroscience like Nirayal does. Find a lens that you can look through to help you understand community as science. And learn enough about that that you can stand in front of an audience at your company or sit with your manager in a one-on-one -on -one and help them understand it better by relating it to science. I think it's actually a power tool that brings all of us community managers to a higher level. We're seen as an art. We're seen as something soft. This is as much science as it everything else. It ties together the way our brains work, the way our culture works. It's shown, the evidence of it is shown in so many of the patterns that we see in nature. One of the questions that came up is, what do I do inside the company to make my people believe? The most important piece of advice that I can offer you is find some champions inside. Don't expect them to change their behavior. Change your behavior. Go to them and ask them. Don't tell them why they should be working with communities. Ask them what problems they have and then slowly and carefully think about the way communities can help them solve that problem. You know, Nir pointed out when he was speaking, pain is a much bigger motivation than avoidance or anything else. You can say to someone, it's going to be, or even a reward, you can say to someone, it's going to be awesome if you work with communities. They're going to help you solve problems in new ways. But if they say, I can't break into that company and I want to get my sales number up, you can go to that point of pain and find out how community can help in a sales organization that serves their enlightened self-interest. And then create that community inside. Have a meetup at your company. Get people talking about some of the problems they're facing, the voids that they see, and see how your relationships with community can help them solve their problems. Your employees, I mean, your coworkers, are not going to come to you saying, we want to solve your problem. They want their problem solved. We are the people who are going to have to change and to modify our behavior to say, we are going to help make it work for you. The other thing is choose your win. You know, some of the questions that people ask me are, how is this as a long-term career plan? What are the rewards I get for doing this well? I think that if we are community managers, there's, there's something here that we know is possible that most people don't understand. And I think we have to choose what our win is and get as much out of that for as long as we keep doing it. We have to know we're making a difference, not only for our companies, but in people's lives. You really have to be comfortable with the role of a bit of an unsung hero. And you have to know that you are a connecting point between something you believe in and the people who share that belief. You're a witness to the power of collaboration and the return of a certain core intelligence, incredible creativity and resourcefulness that people share, but you're not going to get rewarded for that in traditional ways in most companies, at least not yet. Some of these companies that are talking today that have brought community managers on as a very core part of an early team, that have made it part of their DNA as they move forward, they're going to set an example that disrupts the hierarchies of some of the more traditional companies. So maybe sharing stories about that or just even just knowing that you're on the right path, that is a pretty big win. And I want to tell you something. Over the years, that has given me so much more satisfaction than even some other jobs or roles that were probably more popular, socially acceptable, or easier for others to understand. Let me see if, oh, stay in touch. This is Dave Lavery. This is the guy who picked up the phone that day that I dialed from my desk at Apple. This is the nice little thing he built back there. It's called the Mars Rover. The people, 
that you are working with are the most passionate people anywhere. They care enough to be a thorn in your side, a grain of sand in that pearl that you're creating at the time that you're shaping your companies. Watch them, stay in touch with them. They'll do amazing things and you'll be part of their journey. And let the journey be that reward. You know, it is hard. Um, I know it's hard. But I hope that moments like today and the opportunity to meet with people like the people in this room do show you that you're on the right path and help you lift up from the everyday slog that we all go through and say, it's actually a pretty darn good view. Now you asked some questions, and I'm going to take some time because I actually have it, I think, I'll go through quickly to answer the things that um, were asked, and then maybe we would have time for a few more. Community manager morale. I tried to answer those questions. Is the person who asked this question in the room? Show of hands. Hi, thank you. I hope I answered some of your questions with that. You're going to have to create some of your own. But I think the best thing you can do is maybe find a morale buddy before you leave this room today, a person or two that you can call and talk with who maybe is from either an industry like yours or something pretty different. And either when the going gets really tough or when something really awesome happens, just have them as a thought partner to help you realize that it's all going to work out okay or you made progress. I think you're going to have to be the champion of your own morale because to be honest, the community doesn't make quite as much noise when you're doing great as when you're facing a challenge. And certainly your company feels the same way. Is this a long-term career or just a stepping stone to a higher up marketing or product role? Well, I'm going to strike one word from that, just. There is nothing just about this job. This is, a, this is a real job. You're making a difference. And you know what? It is a long-term career, even if you step to a higher up marketing or product or CEO or founder or whatever it is role, because you will never stop being a community evangelist. Once you see this truth, you will take that with you everywhere you go, and it'll help you be better at what you do. How to define and measure community or health? Any helpful tools for measuring? We shared there's some really good ones today. Um, and I will actually flip ahead because I had a couple of specifics I wanted to add here. One moment. I would say um, the ROI question, it still bugs me after all of these years. The ROI should be self-evident. But what I would look to do is even use some online metrics. You know, there are a lot of things out there that are sort of standard industry practices that show the difference in value between a loyal user and a new user, that show the difference between converting an existing customer, the value of converting that customer relative to initiating a new customer. Get some of those facts and try to benchmark some correlations with things you're seeing in your own communities, your own patterns, and come up with three or four solid metrics that you're willing to commit to for a year or so, six months maybe, and then get a buy-in from the people who make decisions about your work or manage you or whatever and say, I'm not sure these are the right facts, but I'm going to track them for a while, and if they're not right after six months or a year, let's try some other ones. But using these, I'm going to try to learn about the value of these members. Not prove, not prove, learn, or better yet, learn more. The fact of the matter is, you have to begin with the belief that this is inherently valuable to everything you do at a company and not be put in that position you're often put in where you have to prove that this is worth other people's time, money, and, and while. Does that make sense to anyone in this room? Cool. Good. So tools for measuring. I love qualitative and quantitative. And one of the things we've heard well today is talk to people. So yeah, get the data from the analytics team. Make one of your buddies in that community you're building inside, a person who really knows your company's analytics, and ask them, what kind of conclusions, what kind of value would they like to draw from the analytics they're gathering? See if you can get into a collaborative conversation with them, but then create a discipline where you get on the phone every Friday or every Tuesday or whatever it is, and you make two or three phone calls and ask some basic questions to whoever picks up the phone, people in your community. Two things will happen. One, you'll get a lot smarter about your job. You'll also get infused with inspiration, morale boosts about the work that you're doing, but you'll also infuse them with the fact that you really are listening and you really do care. And if they told one or two or three people that, or if they even tweeted that, or if they mentioned it next time they were in a meeting when someone was trying to decide what product to buy, 
trust me, that phone call would well be worth your time. The challenge of being the first touch point. Where do we get all the answers? So this one kept me awake last night. What went wrong that made it seem that the community person was the one who should have all the answers? That there was this big company coming to a point, and there was this big world of customers going out to another point, and you were that one person who was responsible for that connection? Something's wrong with that picture. So what I would say is, think about the word of permeability. If you look at that touch point, kind of like we said earlier, like the real value is when people start helping each other without you. It's kind of like sending a child off to school when you know they have it and they don't need you anymore. Sure, it's a little sad, but it's actually the greatest triumph. Bring them together where they can help each other. And so rather than feeling like you need to be that first touch point, ask the question, what can we do to increase permeability? Are we responding fast enough to appease our audience? This one broke my heart too. Appease our audience. There's something meta about that. There's something more at play. And I think that question outs the way that most people see community. They want a quick fix. They're not looking to build permeability and relationship. And then are we right? It's a big burden to bear that isn't necessarily given thought by higher ups. Is the person who asked this question willing to raise a hand? OK, Shana, you of all people? Oh my gosh. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. You're the band aid, the fix it guy, and the toolkit, too. It, it does. Unfortunately, too often it's true, and that's why I found some of the things shared today to be so powerful. So um, that's why I'm glad you left that job, and we got to work together for a while. And this was not a setup. I had, I had forgotten it was you who asked that. Okay. And still surfacing great users and content, especially separate from social media, the great content that isn't promoted. You know, I didn't quite understand this one, but in the interest of time, if that was your question, find me at the end and I'll try to help, I'll, I'll try to be better at understanding it. Integration and cross-collaboration internally, interface and communication between departments and externally, the end user and seamless user experience. I think this is a call for permeability in a really great way, and also a call for maybe trying to put together a community meetup. You know, I don't know what you call it inside your company, but getting people together to talk about it. One other thing that I think I skipped by as I was going through is someone said, what's that fine line between marketing and community? And I think it's really important when you think about that to think about the word generosity and also the word about, to, about needs. First of all, be generous. Give more to these people than you ever hope to take, even if it's just your presence, your attention, your awareness, along with the information. Acknowledge, acknowledge that they are important to you and that you are there listening. That intention will override a lot of limitations even if you don't have that full support from your company. The other thing to think about with that is, let me think, um, oh, make sure that whatever you share with community is about what they need not about what you need or you want. Don't push to them because they will push back. What you should be thinking about as you look at that fine line between content marketing and sort of activating the community to increase their ROI, remember that that is not going to really fuel long-term growth. I bet all of us know that. And finding healthy ways to talk about that. I find that if-then statements are a pretty simple way to approach it. If we were to do this, we might get a little spike in this, but the data has shown, even with other sorts of companies, that if you burn out your community by trying to push to them or sell to them, long term you will see a wane that cannot be raised again. So the thing is, is you know, I see people nodding as we hear it. Don't we know things that would be valuable for so many more people in the company? And yet the problem is so many in the company resist hearing about this because in their minds they're still command and control. They think they have the problem solved. So this is the conundrum that a lot of us are, are facing. 
where community fits into an organization. You know, I had some thoughts on that. I've heard a lot today from you, marketing, uh, customer support, product. I like product. But my first answer for this is I think it should report to the CEO. I think it should be an early hire, and it should be a chief community officer. That's right. right. Positioning yourself as a special ambassador of truth, reality, and a little bit of predictive analytics to the people who are making the key decisions in the company, to me, that's where, that's where I would place it if I were running a company. I met someone today who was talking about, they call their, uh, I think he said, expert knowledge something. I don't remember. Do you, Stephen, it was you. What did you call that, that group you were working with? Expert Say it one more time. Expert there you go. So this is a title that might actually be better than community. I mean, if we understand marketing, marketing is about making your message relevant to the audiences that you rely on to cause your business to grow. If we're community people causing our, wanting our businesses to grow, our, our, our strength and our success to grow, maybe we talk about them as you know, expert crowds or super users or something like that. Try it for a while. See if it makes a difference. And then how to get attention in this area of increasingly macro and overdramatic content. Everyone's screaming for attention. But Nir gave us the answers. It's about relevance. It's about having something that really is aspirational and of value inherently to your users. And my key to that is know your audience, know what matters to your audience, and give generously of the things that they want most. My closing thoughts for you are keep the faith. We're building this thing together, and the good news is, it's growing. And it's a really beautiful thing for me to experience through your words and through the things that I've learned today. Oop. And then the last one is, history is still being written. Live long and prosper. Thank you.